Hello and welcome to DDR series on India's HSTDV and hypersonic program. In the earlier videos, we've seen exactly what happened during DRDO's first successful hypersonic scramjet engine test with the HSTDV, and then how the scramjet engine in the HSTDV works, as well as the aerodynamics aspects of the scramjet engine itself. In the previous video, we saw why thermal protection systems are needed for hypersonic vehicles and what materials are used for thermal protection. If you have not watched any of them, go watch them first. Links are in the description below. You can now contribute to DDR's efforts at bringing you the latest in aerospace and defense indigenous development by contributing through UPI. We really value all your contributions. Thank you for everyone who's contributed so far. You could also join the DDR community on YouTube right here by clicking on the join link in the description below. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to be notified every time we post a new video. In this one, we'll take a look at fuel, which is another key component of any engine. Every propulsion system has a tailor-made fuel. The SR-71 Blackbird needed a special fuel. The Russian Zircon hypersonic missile has a special fuel. Scramjet engine designers have spent enormous amounts of effort into developing specific fuel. We've seen in our earlier video how ignition delay is a key factor in fuel selection for scramjet engines due to the extremely short time that fuel spends within the combustor, literally milliseconds. But that is not the only factor. The BrahMos missile reportedly uses slush hydrogen as fuel. Slush hydrogen is a cryogenic fuel of liquid hydrogen with solid hydrogen particles in it. This improves the density of the fuel by about 15%. We've seen in an earlier video that hydrogen has high specific energy content as well as its fast reacting characteristics in air. Using slush hydrogen reduces the issues of dealing with liquid hydrogen such as low density, temperature stratification, hazards associated with high vent rates and unstable flight conditions caused by sloshing of the liquid in the fuel tank etc. Hydrocarbon fuels are safer and easier to handle. Given that scramjet engines are liquid fueled and will have to be fueled prior to making them ready to be used, such considerations are extremely important for designers. Hydrocarbon fuels like kerosene are attractive candidates for fueling scramjet engines in the less than 8 Mach number flight regimes. Simple hydrocarbons like methane CH4, proves difficult to ignite within the scramjet engine according to many researchers. Moreover, liquid hydrocarbons require rapid vaporization before mixing and subsequent combustion. Ethylene or the IUPAC name ethene is a hydrocarbon of the formula C2H4 proved to be a short chain hydrocarbon that can function well as a scramjet fuel. It is the lightest olefinic hydrocarbon as well as the organic hydrocarbon consumed in the greatest quantity worldwide. It is made by heating natural gas especially its ethane and propane composites or petroleum to around 900 degrees centigrade. This gives a mixture of gas from which ethylene is separated. All the refractory materials mentioned in the previous video on materials provide passive cooling capabilities. For passive thermal protection systems, they work well enough. But for combustors and internal use within the scramjet engine, while most refractory materials can perform for a short time, missile and transport applications will need components to work for long durations and multiple times. A 1500 km hypersonic missile flying at nearly Mach 8 will fly for nearly 10 minutes. For these, active cooling is an attractive technique, just like how internal combustion engines are cooled with a coolant and a radiative fan. Active cooling can be done by regenerative, film, transpiration cooling and a combination of all of these methods. In fact, even for some leading edges and nose caps, active cooling and transpiration cooling techniques are being studied. Regenerative cooling is a cooling technique where liquids are piped through cooling channels beneath surfaces that face intense heating. These liquids carry away the heat ensuring that the surfaces can remain within their operational temperature limits. Hypersonic vehicles tend to have extremely sharp radii in their leading edges which face extreme heating, as we've seen in the previous video. Building internal cooling channels to pipe fluids in such spaces is extremely challenging. Unlike cars and trucks or even fighter aircraft say, hypersonic missiles cannot have radiators and so this method is of limited use because the fuel that carries the heat has to exchange the heat somewhere. Using endothermic fuel is a way to beat that challenge. We've seen earlier how fuel injection struts 
can be cooled by piping the fuel in channels within the strut leading edges prior to releasing it into the airstream. If you remember, while hydrogen has a high specific impulse, it has other disadvantages and hence not preferred as fuel for hypersonic applications. But the presence of hydrogen decreases ignition time and ignition delay of kerosene and it also helps in anchoring flames at high speeds of the airflow in a scramjet combustor. That's where endothermic fuel comes in. An endothermic fuel, like long-chain hydrocarbons, is one that absorbs heat, undergoes thermal cracking and splits into simpler alkanes, alkenes and even hydrogen. This is a win-win where heat is absorbed by the fuel and easier to burn fuel is generated in C2. If you can generate hydrogen as a byproduct, it becomes an even better proposition. There are several types of endothermic reactions possible during regenerative cooling, dehydrogenation, Cracking and steam reforming are the most important reactions. To design catalytic cracking based systems, scientists reached out to the petroleum industry, where such catalysts are widely used to create fuels of different chain lengths and molecular weights. The civilian petrochemical industry has had decades of experience breaking down long chain hydrocarbons and extracting several different types of shorter chain fuels. Scientists at the University of Dayton Research Institute found that highly branched chain alkanes had slightly less endothermic ability compared to normal straight chain alkanes but also produce a lot more coke. CSIR NAL propulsion division developed a mixed bed catalytic system consisting of aluminium silicate molecular sieves, ZSM5 and Reformax 100 catalysts for proving endothermic cooling as well as the in situ generation of hydrogen gas. The fuel, kerosene in this case, passes through molecular sleeves zeolite catalyst coated fuel pipelines and absorbs the heat from the hot structures of the vehicle. It then undergoes cracking into simpler compounds that burn readily in the combustor. But as mentioned earlier, coke formation on catalyst particles is a major hurdle for application of endothermic fuel cracking since it reduces catalyst effectiveness and decreases flow rates. To prevent coke formation, nickel is sometimes used as a coating on basic supports Dehydrogenation methods use catalysts like platinum, but it tends to fall off very quickly with coke buildup. In the US, AFRL, Air Force Research Laboratory, is directing programmers to come up with the optimum fuel as well as a combination of catalysts for peak performance. In China, a research group in Tianjin University is also performing similar research. Straight chain versus branch chain, ease of cracking versus buildup of coke, after burning fuel are all questions that these researchers are trying to solve. The French via MBDA developed the PTAH SOCAR CMC technology to use ceramic matrix composites technology in the scramjet engines in the late 90s and early 2000s. They use cooling channels in the composite materials to actively cool combustors. We've seen film cooling such as on gas turbine engine blades where cooler air is pumped through discrete holes on the surface of the turbine blades to create a film of cooler fluid to protect the surface from direct heat. So even if struts in the combustor are made of materials like ZRCV2 which can withstand long duration operation without requiring active cooling would require active cooling. The combustor that DRDO is developing made of carbon silicon carbide composite has inbuilt channels to funnel fuel through it. Apart from channels, porosities of these composites can also be tailored to a limited extent to allow fuel to percolate through them creating a film cooling effect. Be it struts or combustor walls, transpiration cooling is an area of intense research to enable efficient cooling of surfaces while maximizing thrust and efficiency. Fuel thus is a vital component for long duration scramjet operation. Hypersonic glide vehicles Unpowered gliders flying at higher Mach numbers and at higher altitudes will need a different method for thermal protection which we will see in a later series on hypersonic glide vehicles. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to be notified every time we post a new video.